good. And it's not dirty. Okay. Actually, I'm a lefty. Your special gift. So you should have a pen. I would encourage you to write down these answers. After this session, I don't think you're going to forget what shape stands for. <laughs> so each and every one of you has either a special gift or special gifts, plural. And each one of them is unique. Each one of them was given to you and only you. And each one of them contributes to the um, what you give to others. Now, H stands for... <laughs> Did you say that, doctor? That's why I got the red pen. <laughs> Heart. Oh. Your heart. Passion. What are you passionate about? What makes you get out of bed, jump up, and say, I can't wait to do something today? Well, <laughs> but passion, your heart, heart is all about your passion. And, and also, I know without a doubt that each and every one of you, part of your heart is your care for others. Or you wouldn't be doing what you're doing or do it so well and touch so many lives. Which is one reason why I absolutely adore and love working with all of you. Every, every opportunity I get, it just fills me with so much joy and so much um, uh, comfort, to be honest. Because it makes me feel like when I'm going to need that care, when my family's going to need that care, I know I can count on all of you. So your heart. And if you can't, well, whatever you're passionate about, ask yourself why. I think a lot of times... And, and I do a lot of consulting with physicians. I do a lot of um, work with all industries, not just healthcare. But a common thread that happens often is people forget why. They forget their passion. They forget why. They go through motions. So they end up scoring a good instead of a very good, or usually instead of an always. <laughs> And I think a lot of it is going through the rote motions and rather than actually remembering the why. So I encourage you as a takeaway, get to know your why again and what it can do for you and what it can do for others. Okay, so the next A. Attitude. Huh? Attitude. I love oh, that, but no. So close. What? Oh, that's a great answer, but no. <laughs> uh, I want to make sure I spell it right. Uh, yes. Your abilities. So, similar to your special gifts, your abilities are a little bit more learned. They're what you've learned along the way, along the path of life. But again, each of us has have abilities that others don't. This is what helps constitute and bring together a fabulous. It's all those special parts and pieces. And truly, without all of them, you can't have that outcome. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. And so what I want to do right now, what we want to do right now, is I want you to get in, I know it's, the setting is a little challenging, but get in a group of other three or four people, maybe. Three, four, five. You'll have to move your chairs, I think, a little bit. I know. Oh, to, but it's fun. Okay, before, wait, wait, wait. No, we're going to be doing it before again. Move, it's not the first time. Before you move, this is, this is what you need to do. This is the assignment. And you only have a few minutes, but in about, uh, like four people, what I want you to do is share four unique skills or abilities that you have, but only one of them is true and three are false, three are lies, oh. but don't tell them what is true or what is not true. Each other has to guess, okay? And um, you think this is easy, but it's actually quite difficult. <laughs> so go ahead and start. So did everybody get that? Did Three get things that? are not true. One thing is true. So think about it for a minute. And then you'll each take a turn sharing what those are with your group. Right. See, see if people guess what the right answer is. So what's true? Three things. Three things. Three things. Three things. Three things. Three things. Three things.
With the abilities, I want everyone, I hope everyone is understanding or kind of getting a point of the fact that you're all unique and you all have unique talents and skills. But more importantly than that, you're all wired for a purpose. You're all wired for purpose. Right? Yep. And isn't it also true? What is your name? Becky. Becky? Becca. Yeah. Becca. Uh -huh. Isn't it also true that sometimes we forget that? Yes. Okay, I'm not alone. <laughs> you can't forget that. Every day you have to remember, okay? Because that is, remember, what you give to everybody else. So, did you learn something new about your team? About co workers? Not yet? Yes? Yeah, we will get the right name. P. What do you think P stands for in the shape of compassionate care? Patience. 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 Yeah. Performance. Patience. Purpose. Purpose. Okay, well, those are all great. In regard to you. In regard to you and how you. Personality. Personality. Okay, so. I want you to all remember each of each one of you has a personality yes everyone has a personality sometimes we might think certain people don't have personalities but no everybody has a personality <laughs> everybody's personality is perfectly suited for that person you may not swallow that very well but I'm telling you right now each one of your personalities is perfect the way it is it was given to you okay don't try to be a copy don't try to be um, an uh, uh, infiltrator you are unique and it can I was say just don't try to be someone else right don't try to be someone else and but remember too I want to make sure this is clear also don't confuse personality and behavior two separate things this is key Personality is how you are. It's your wire, it's, your, it's in your DNA, it's your foundation. Behaviors are learned. They're your habits. Some are good, some are bad. Some are kind of on their way to being better and some kind of slip. But behavior can be changed. Personality really isn't. It's who you are. So again, remember that is a unique attribute. It's a unique gift that you have that helps you provide compassionate care to your patients. And everyone's is different. So, who else has personalities? Patients. Say that again louder. The patients. The patients. They all have different personalities too. And so, um, you know, my personality may not be as suited for somebody as another person's personality, which goes back again to what we've been saying many times now today about the team and understanding the team, understanding the attributes. It all ties in together. <laughs> But personality, don't, don't try to change your personality. Change behaviors, but keep your personality. And just to add on to that, and that's why if, if we've ever had a conversation, maybe an orientation for anybody that started in the last couple of years, or even before that, I went to grab for my badge. I'm so used to having my badge. It's not but it's in your folder. But it's why when, whenever we discuss something like data, you know that model to always acknowledge and introduce yourself? Those are behaviors that we can all be sure to learn and model. But telling somebody exactly what to say and how to say it every time. That's right. Because it's your personality. So that's why I say take those things, for example, make it a part of your interaction with your right. patients and your families, but do it in a way that is unique to you, right. your style. Get it all in there, but do it in that way that is comfortable with your personality. It's perfect. And just to add to that, think about a song. A classic song, something that 
um, you've heard many times over and you've heard many artists with their own variations of that song and no two are ever alike, right? It's the same thing. So um, thank you for sharing that. That's, and then E, we come to E, the final. What do you think E is? <laughs> <laughs> it could be. It could be, but in regards to how you deliver compassionate care. Excellent. Empathy. Empathy. Well, excellent. It, it's, it's not empathy. Should, what makes you <laughs> empathy? So, experience. You know, I want to share something with you. A day I'll never forget. Actually, there's four days I'll never forget. January 2nd, 2016. December 25th, 2015. December 29th, 2015. And January 6th, 2016. Not even four months ago. January, um, January 2nd was the last day I talked to my mother this year. December 25th, she wasn't feeling very well after, uh, that night of Christmas night. The 29th, December 29th, she did go to her doctor who was on vacation, so she saw his assistant, who sent her home with an upper respiratory infection. January 6th also happened to be my oldest son's birthday. My mother passed away at 7.39 a.m. from sepsis. Four days. So on January 2nd, I was in the ER having a conversation with my mother, who wasn't really in her normal state of mind. But of course, I didn't quite know what was going on. We didn't. That Those four days, I was just living in the ICU. She also had MRSA. It was just very difficult. <clears throat> on the 6th at 7.39, actually at 7.38, my children and my aunt were rushing to get gowns on, but then they said, just come in the room to be around me as I held my mom <clears throat> and saw her pass away. That's an experience that I'm sharing with all of you. Because I've got to tell you, I'll never forget Arby, the ICU nurse, who explained every little thing to me and to my and whoever was there honestly i was alone my family god bless them all but they just they couldn't handle it they were not ready my stepfather put me in complete care of all decisions he couldn't handle it it's a lot of weight to put on somebody without any experience without any uh, foreknowledge she was fine and then she wasn't she was healthy she was his caretaker he's an amputee it turned our whole life upside down. I'm still living in it. Now I'm a caretaker for my stepfather. My whole life has changed. But I'm sharing this with you because that, that one, it's my experience and I, I plan on sharing it with many people because it, I hope it changes other people's lives and helps them understand what you said, doctor, the empathy. We have all been in those shoes in some way, shape, or form, and we'll continue. I guarantee you I will go through more. This is just the beginning. This is setting me up for the next. So, but that, that one nurse, Arby, I'll never forget his care, his compassion, his desire to have me know everything because he asked me, what's important to you? What is important to you? And I said, I want to know every single thing. I don't care when you call me. And he made sure everybody on that team did that. So I, I praise the fact that he was there. I can't say the same for every doctor, I'm sorry, every nurse, every doctor in that care, but that made a big difference for me. We all go through difficult times, but what are some of the positives that can come out of experiences such as that? What are some positives? Are there any positives? Sure, there's a combination of the wonderful people that I work with. But those people exist and make this world a much better place. Absolutely. I hope for the rest of the world because the fact that people that are in this room exist and do what they do provides hope for everyone else because 
They should be using a wealthy woman. They sacrifice a lot. They truly care about people. Absolutely. They make the world better. Much Thank better. you. Yes, what else is a positive outcome from <coughs> difficult times? When you experience uh, a tragedy or, or a life altering experience, <clears throat> you now know how to help others better. Right. You you're more equipped. You're better equipped. You know what worked for you when you were going through that. Was it positive? What somebody did? You know, you filter right. what, what you think might be helpful because you come from that place. Absolutely. Yes. And this experience and the shape is everything is interrelated. Absolutely. Because the experience which you are going through it transforms your behavior. The way you interact with people, the way you look at the world, your perception has changed completely. So experience and these all things are connected to each other. Absolutely. Other things that come out of difficult times. Doesn't it make you realize just how good the great the good things are, even especially the littlest of things? Mm -hmm. The kindness of a stranger, you know, the little things that we take for granted until we go through a difficult time. And it's it's very easy to forget. And and it does ground us. It helps us remember our limitations, but also more importantly, um, our absolutely our strengths and where we can go and what we do have. So what we'd like you to do now is what we call a pair share. Now, if if this is too heavy for you, we understand, but we do encourage you to pair up with someone. The person, either ideally someone you're not sitting next to, but whatever works in this space and you know share a time when it was a particularly difficult time in your life it doesn't have to be as difficult as the one I shared with you but um, but how did the com the compassion <coughs> and care of others get you through help get you through it so take a few minutes so in your packet you will find a stapled handout that says expectations framework if you can just pull that out. Okay. So as Mark was saying, really the first step in understanding what a patient's expectations are is asking them or is somehow finding out. You need to understand what the expectation is, which is why we asked the question we did when you were um, coming in after lunch. So we pulled uh, a few of the exam a few of the responses that you um, shared. <coughs> and the first one we're going to use is someone responded that the expectation patients have of Caritas is unique, available. available attention from caregivers. Convenience for families. Would you agree as a whole yes. with that? Okay. So if you look, the next step is, okay, the challenge. So what is the challenge with this expectation? I know there's kind of two. But, but what do you, yeah. What do you all think? What do they expect? Say what, that again? What do the families expect? I mean, what do they want? Well, that we've already identified that that's the expectation. Is it realistic? But, right. It's the challenge is, 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 what, yeah, is there, what do they consider convenient for themselves? Yeah. So. Okay, so you ha it sounds like what you're saying to me is that you have to get further definition of what convenience is, um, excellence, attention, exactly. So what does that require of you? Time. Well, yes. maybe. What is what? Thank you. It requires communication. And and again, it's the more prepared you are in regards to service excellence of any sort. It's all about preparation. It's all managing expectations is is really the cornerstone of excellent service, excellent experience. And it doesn't necessarily take a lot of time, but it does take a foundation. And one of the most key foundations you could do is understand this. Ask, you know, find out, get the clarity. Because as Mark said, that was a great analogy about the dining and the dinner. And you know, I don't know if I'd expect someone to give me a free dinner, but somebody else might. So you really don't know. Don't assume you know the answer. But it, sometimes it doesn't take a lot of time. 
again, with my experience in the hospital with my mother, the staff had it on their whiteboard, on their communication board, what is the number one most important thing for you? Um, what, is, what, what, what is excellent care to you? That one question. That is the one question that really mattered a lot for me in that moment. So, Did people ask you that? Yes. Every nurse asked me that question every shift. They were wired for that, and it was so simple. So even if it's not written on your whiteboard, that's a, an excellent question. Were they able to provide it? What you asked for? I would say eight out of ten times. The, and the shift that was hard was the night, the overnight shift. <clears throat> Kelly, did your response change from day one as things changed with your mom's condition? Or would you no. The same? I still wanted as much information so I knew what to give my family. So for me, it didn't really change. Well, and they couldn't bring my mom back, so that wasn't going to happen. But what, what I think, in my opinion, what, the one thing that most patients want, and they probably want most, is for a nurse to be there within five seconds of the time that they ring the bell. Yeah. yeah. Okay? And that's obviously, I mean, these nurses kill themselves. That's, I mean, if they can get there within a few minutes, that's great. Right. I don't know how one sets realistic expectations. I mean, somebody comes to my office and, and they look like a Sharpe and they, they, they want me to make them look like... <laughs> <laughs> like not a Sharpe. <laughs> right. <laughs> that stays in this room. Don't worry, doctor. <laughs> I won't share that. <laughs> you know, I do. It's clearly, I mean, the first sample I expect, you know, I'm, I mean, they, and it's common. A that look like that look like Raquel Welch, you know, in her 2000 BC. Famous, in the bit, yeah. And, and they're now, right. now 68, 5, 6, 240, and they say, this was me. So. And I've heard you're good. <laughs> Helen, as great as she is, she can't be there in three seconds. <laughs> we agree. Those He's already. Yeah. You set those expectations. So, yeah. but you're answering. That's can you deliver? That's exactly the next step. Can you honestly deliver on that expectation? I think if we set the expectation with the patient, I am going to be. I when you ring, I'm going to get here as quickly as I can. But understand that I have three other patients. So just know I'm going to get your bell and I will be there as quickly as I can. And what is that? That's communication. Yeah, so patients well, don't cool. want to hear that you have, have three other patients. That was just the message. I understand. Yeah. So, so let me ask you a question. That's such a good example. It's what a great you guys example. Are doing, what you're doing right now, look, can we agree that Caritas patients want to be responded to quickly? Yes. One on one, I understand. So that's what, that's what to me, that's what this said. Yes. So you're right. You need to get more information sometimes. But if you keep it at that level, we can all agree that that's what they want. And so, how do you set the expectations? And you guys are scripting, whether you realize it or not. You're talking through what you might say to somebody. And then as soon as you say it, you go, oh, wait, I may not want to say that. Maybe I could say that. Um, does the perfect thing come out of your mouth the very first time? Does it ever? No. It never does for me. It just doesn't. At least for me, sometimes, I hesitate. I well, slightly hesitate to ask some of those questions because how do you, if their expectations aren't realistic, how do we handle the yeah. no with like customer service so we can bring it in with compassion? You know? Well, let me turn this around actually. So let's say you're the patient and um, you have certain expectations, but nobody has a conversation with you at all about their stay and things just start happening. Is that a better experience for you? No. Right. So you're, no one is expert at everything and clearly we don't know what will come out of every person's mouth, let alone every patient's mouth. So I do think it's worth a conversation or an understanding, okay. preparation, um, a plan. Um, but try to remember always yourself in their shoes. You know, what, what would you want to know? Um, so, were you going to yeah, add something just, to I, that? I was just going to say, I think it's better to know. Yeah. It's kind of like 
whether it's expectations or wait times, is it better? Wait to time, know? yes. If you're in the ED and the wait time's going to be three hours, do you tell somebody or not? By the way, do you tell them it's going to be about three hours? You, you guys are not. You have to you give them a, a heads way. up. You find a way. Oh, in your it's own personality. Be at least a few hours before we see you, right? No, you don't say it that way. But you find a way to deliver, right? And, and just like you find a way to ask about expectations or about something in particular, yeah. even if the answer is <clears throat> difficult, um, so that you, because now, and Janice, we talked about this as we talked about being here today. Um, if you've got, I don't want to use the word difficult, but if you have a family that has a lot of expectations and demands and challenges, right? And they want this and this and this, and they want three rooms, and mm -hmm. they want to cordon off this, and they want, we're going to go through a couple of scenarios. Um, do you start feeling like you're more or less in control? Yeah, who has the control of the situation? You start feeling like you have less ability to manage, but when you have the expectations conversation, I think it's your best shot to sort of take charge of, even though it's somebody else's expectations, by knowing you have a chance to now help shape them or discuss them or find a way to talk about what can happen and maybe what can happen and why. Could someone agree with you on that? So and, maybe and it's empowering, actually, to think about by knowing what someone's expectations are. You're in the best position to create a better experience for them in the long run. And just to wrap up that, there's a lot of comfort that people get when someone else is in charge. Think about that. You know, so they, they do need that, that discipline. And, oh, sorry. But I hope we answered your question. Which leads us to the next se section. <laughs> and I'm going to give this to you. Okay. I'm not sure where you are. I'm going to put it. <laughs> yes. I think it's very important when people are waiting. You mentioned that you can't get the bed. You know, tell them when they come in, you say, for example, I'm a nurse. I'm going to know when your bell, when you weigh the bell. It's very important to me that I get you as fast as I can. Exactly. If I'm with another patient, I'm going to come right away as soon as I'm done with that patient, and then I'm going to give you all the time you need. So please understand, I'm giving that patient all the time they need at that point, but I'm going to come as soon as I can. And I say the same thing in my office. Thank you so much for understanding. I'm delayed coming over. I'm giving each patient all the time they need, and I'm going to give you all the time you need. Thank you for understanding. Exactly. Say it again. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is recorded. Yeah. And that's exactly <laughs> it. It's setting the foundation, the, 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 the parameters ahead of time, and that is controlling it. That is providing comfort, really, for that patient and their family, because they know, and they can count on it. Um, I just want to tag on to that. <laughs> You know, in Caritas, we have a lot of people, I think, more than other units, that the families come out. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so, I introduce this at the beginning, and I introduce it especially when they start coming out. And I remind them that when they do put the call out, on, it does come to our phone. That's a great reminder. And instead of coming out and finding nobody in the unit and getting frustrated, or kind of, kind of hunting us down, I say, I'll get your call. And, you know, I say the exact same thing. You know, if I'm with a patient, then I will answer and I'll let you know that I'll be there shortly. Or if it's an emergency, I'll come right away. So that they know that if it's something that it's urgent, they know that they can trust me to come. Absolutely. Yeah. So that kind of... Setting, you know, managing. It's part of managing yeah. expectations. And everyone should be saying something like that. No. So it does lead into our next section. It does. Too. And so just to wrap this part off, part up, and then to move on, you each have these great tools and words and powers, if you will, to handle these conversations. So the more you guys are talking together, whether it's in your huddle, pick something and get everybody's thoughts a challenge. But work, this is where I see all of you, and I'm sure you do, working together to handle these expectations is where you find your success. 
But knowing that there are challenging, there are challenging situations, and especially for your unit, let's talk a little bit about um, managing different, uh, difficult situations and things that you can do, techniques you can use. But before we do, we have a little video to show you. So, a little multimedia. So cue video, Tony. Lights. Lights, camera, video. Thank you. heard what no woman ever wants to hear. You have breast cancer. And I'm, I remember sitting up and go, what did you just say? And she said, yeah, you have breast cancer. It's confirmed. I walked out of the breast center and I stood in the lobby going, oh my god, what the hell just happened? I had a very uncommon occurrence when your pancreas explodes, as mine did, it felt like somebody cut me wide open and put a red hot frying pan in my abdomen. And that happened over minutes. I went from living my life to as uh, about sick as a human being can be. Over the four months of hospitalization, I had 20 operations or major procedures. My wife literally camped out at my bedside every day because we didn't know that was going to be the last day. I had to have a CT of the abdomen. That's what they found out. I had a mass on my kidney. I'm like, oh my God. Just to hear the word cancer can blow anyone away. I was driving home. I didn't feel right. My car drove off the median, dropped about 30, 35 feet. I had had a seizure, broke my back, sternum, ankle. A lot of things were broken. I spent about three and a half weeks unconscious and really had almost none of my major organs working. And yet I was hearing many conversations quite shortly. My family had two discussions about end of life care. I had the thought how interesting it was that I was watching myself die. When I initially was diagnosed, how it was presented to me could have been maybe a softer touch. I mean, she scared me. I mean, it's scary stuff to begin with, but she knew I was alone. All I was worried about was the living. I wanted to dance at my daughter's wedding. I wanted to, I wanted to hold my grandchildren. Having that fear, not knowing what the outcome was going to be. I was being sustained only by two feet. I was unable to eat. It was very difficult to, to do almost anything. So to be reduced to somebody who's essentially dependent on others for almost every facet of your activity of daily living is really difficult. It's sort of a helpless feeling, especially when you're immobile. That's even more helpless because you really rely on them for everything. So having that one-on-one -on -one communication because really you're waiting there and you're laying in that bed all day and all you want is five or ten minutes that's it so during my icu stay i lost 50 pounds every time that the nurses and others came to turn me to change the seats to clean me up it felt as if my hips and my shoulders were coming out of joint when you have completely lost your ability to care for yourself, you find yourself vulnerable and with limited dignity left. walking a little slower than you. You don't really know 
what they're going through. A lot of people tell me, oh, I know how it feels. You know what? Until you become a patient, no, you do not. Those feelings are entirely different. Yes, they are. I can tell within seconds of a caregiver entering my room of whether they were in the moment and actually caring about me. It's a sense that you know if they're there to help, whether it's from holding their hand or patting them on the back. All those things end up being very important. The sicker you are, probably more important than you are. When I feel like I'm at the end of my rope sometimes during a busy day and I try to put myself back in that bed. And then when I see somebody who might be angry, who might be frustrated, I remind myself what that feels like to be there. And then it makes sense. Reactions? Comments? Yeah? The twist, of course, is Cleveland Clinic does these wonderful videos. We show one, an empathy video at orientation. They're all caregivers there, right? Just like, like we are. The empathy, the compassion, is what reminds and fuels us, I think, to handle all the different situations we, you know, we need to. It was Cleveland Clinic, but is there any reason why that couldn't have been Providence St. John's? There's really none, is there? And those caregivers that appeared in the video and had their experience, they could be all of us, they could be you. And maybe they are, because some of us have been patients. I just shared a quick story, and many of you have as well. So, so when you when you're have a patient in a family that is feeling challenging to you, right? What, why is it that someone is challenging, right? Why does somebody complain? Or why do they start acting out? Why do they? They feel vulnerable. Yeah. They feel vulnerable. They feel like they've lost control. They, that's their means of controlling the situation there. Yeah. Nothing yeah. It's, it, it is a reminder that they're not at their best. More answers? Vulnerable, lost control. Fear. Fear is huge. Fear. That's right. Fear. Right. And I'm sorry to someone else. Sometimes they don't even know it. They just like. Sure. It just comes out and they can't get Right. Right. And it, and it, um, and when somebody is really upset and they're really angry, let's say, and you're the person that has to be on point to receive it. Well, it seems like a given, but how does it feel? It, it's, it doesn't feel great, does it? Even if you're remembering or reminding yourself, it doesn't feel great. I know when someone is upset, so on occasion I will come visit a room when somebody wants to speak to administration or one of our directors or someone will, come, will call me and say, can you come talk to somebody because they're really upset. They want Marcel, but before they get Marcel, they get somebody else sometimes. And I know right away, and I do this all the time, and I, ent I go in the room and I'm remembering my aided and my eye contact, and the moment I feel that somebody is really frustrated at something, I can feel it happening to me too. It happens every time in my own sense, and I'm getting riled up, right? And so what do you do? There's no, there's no, there's no perfect answer. There's no perfect answer. I will, I will share one thing with you, and that is um, one thing that is in your folder. If you'll open it up, is our commitment to caring. The little pocket card. It's laminated, so it's about this big, and it's laminated. And I wanted to share something with you that's on there. Okay, so. Let's hold it up. Someone hold it up. Okay, yes, okay. So I re these have been updated, and I reordered them, and they have some new information on it. 
they're very similar to what they were before, but they've been updated. And when I ordered them and redid them, they came back not folded. So you're doing a very good job. It's your job to fold it into a trifold, okay? And when you do that, you will notice, if you didn't remember, that it happens to be the exact same size and shape as your badge. Now, is that an accident? Is that a coincidence or on purpose? And so, right. And so, when you go back to the office, I'd like you, if you were already carrying around this card with you, replace it with this one because it's newer. And if you weren't carrying it around, I want you to consider carrying it around with you. Um, why would someone carry that card around with them? Why? Why do you think somebody would? A reminder? It could be a reminder. It could be a reminder of our mission and uh, to create experiences for our patients and families. I don't think anybody's going to carry it around, and I don't think you're going to carry it around because you're going to pull it out and you're going to go, good morning, Mrs. Johnson, I am, and follow the steps. That's not very organic, right? But, but it is symbolic. There are ways you could pull it out with a family um, or a patient, I'll tell you in a minute. But the reason I asked you to pull it out now is the one model that's on that card that I really do think you might look at or remind yourself of. And it works when somebody is upset or when a situation is challenging and it works in its simplicity. And this is the very weird part because it's not that complicated. But on that card is that LEAP model. And this is what we're talking about like service recovery or how do you get somebody back when they're in the red zone? They're so upset. They're so frustrated. Something's happening. You know, nothing good happens in the red zone. I can't hear anything. I'm not willing to move forward. And it's not good for the patient. And then it starts not being good for you, right? And you sit, you find yourself standing there. And before you know it, somebody has said right to your face, you're stupid. I don't want you as my nurse. We heard that this morning, right? That's pretty harsh. That's a pretty harsh example. I don't think that happens all that often, but it can happen. You're stupid and I don't want you as my nurse. Well, what is the first, what does L stand for in LEAP? What does it say on that card? Listen. And as hard as it is, by the way, LEAP works at home. I'm not very good at using it at home. I just want to tell you, but it does work with loved ones. You can try it if you want to. Again, I've ne I haven't had much success. Maybe it might work with teenage children. I don't know. But if the L is LEAP, and it LEAP is listen, it starts by listening, right? T to truly understand. Let somebody express and get out what it is that is the problem. And that's not always easy. And you can't just, you can't just pretend to listen. You really need to listen. Because if you're, you're telling me what your concern is or why you're so upset and you don't want me as your nurse, and I'm sitting there and I'm going, uh-huh, yeah. Or I'm rolling my eyes. What does it mean when someone rolls their eyes, right? No, you have to really listen. But it's not enough to listen. It's not enough just to listen because after you listen, you have to let somebody know you heard them. You don't have to let them know necessarily that you agreed with them, but you have to let them know you heard them. And the E in LEAP is empathize. So you have to do or say something that lets somebody know, I did hear what you said to me. Right? So that could be the form of, I, I, under I understand why you're so upset. Now, if you, if you agree with somebody and something is happening that should not be happening and you would feel the same way, I, I, under, I would feel the same way if I were you. I'd be very upset. I understand. Something that tells somebody that you've heard them. Now you've listened. You've let them know, I heard you. I've got it. Um, well, every time you come in the room, you do this and this, and I don't really understand why that's important, or I, you haven't explained it to me. Okay, now you're starting to get information. I understand. I understand. What if I did a better job? What if I did this or this and this? Would that be better? You might be able to head it off at the path before it gets worse. So you've listened and you've empathized. And then the A in LEAP is to 
ask questions. When you ask questions, you're engaged. You might get really good information, but you don't start asking questions, right, before you've listened to somebody and understood. We were checking in recently. We like to go to Yosemite. I was checking in at the lodge where we're staying, and right next to me, this really does happen because my brain works this way, like leap goes on in my brain and I'm at a hotel, but right next to me, the gentleman comes up and he says to the receptionist, we booked online and what we thought we were expecting and we ordered is not what's with the room and we ordered and he was upset. This is not, talk about expectations. This isn't what we paid for. And what do you think, and, and the first thing out of the gentleman's mouth that was behind the desk was, well, I can't be responsible if you ordered online. I, we don't always know what you... I mean, he went straight to sort of defensive mode. He didn't even want to, you know, a little bit of tell me more. Tell me what you booked. Tell, let me understand. You know, he could have known already that the answer was, I'm not going to be able to change your room, right? But, but the way he handled it, and I watched this antagonistic thing happen right next to me, and I wanted to push, like, pause and to call him aside and go, look at this because I carry my badge everywhere I go. Right, yes. look at Leap, maybe you should try this. But you've listened, you've empathized, you've asked questions, now comes the apology in Leap. It doesn't even come until the third step. And that's when you hit somebody with a sincere, heartfelt <coughs> apology. Can you apologize for something that is not, that doesn't have anything to do with you? Yeah. 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 Right. You can apologize for a situation. Could you apologize for a process or a procedure that's beyond your control, a weight that you had nothing to do with? Certainly, right? Um, can you apologize even if you don't agree with somebody? Yes. Right? That's hard for some people. Some people take things very personally, and then it's hard to make that apology, but of course you can. And then the P is produce a solution. So I just wanted to draw our attention back to that LEAP model. It's pretty simple, actually, but it really does work. But I think the, the trick is, in that moment, when you feel yourself being upset and triggered because somebody else is upset, is to just is to bring it down and just remember it and start off by, t by hearing what somebody has to say, right? And using all those skills, yeah. That's a beautiful uh, description, and I think, and great, great ideas. You know, Mark, what you're saying is so true. You can never go wrong apologizing under certain circumstances. I could, I could feel as strongly as possible that I disagree with what you're saying, Right. And I can say, you know, Mark, I'm so sorry that you, you feel, feel that, that way. way. Yeah. I'm so yeah. sorry that you had that experience. I'm so sorry <clears throat> that you feel I wasn't attentive. I'd like to make that better. Right. I'd like to try right. to improve upon that. Right. And just hearing I'm sorry, right. some people, they just feel better. A lot of people right. feel better. Right. I'm so okay. sorry. I disagree with you, but I'm not going to say that. Right. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Right. <laughs> or, or, I'm so sorry you feel that way. Or, or I understand. Now I understand. I understand that you want your medicines, you want to bring this, you want to have this from home. Now you know the answer is, I don't think this is going to happen. Even if I talk to Janice, this is against right. our rules. Right. But I understand. And then I apologize that I can't, that I can't, whatever it is. Um, by the way, I, sh I should have said it before, but in the video, I meant, to, I thought someone might mention it, but. And, and as a tribute to this morning and compassion and empathy, there's the one line that the one doctor gives, and he says something about, I know right away, right? Did you, did you catch that one? I know right away when somebody enters my room. Do you mind if I put you on the spot and ask you, in telling your story, Margaret, yeah, in telling your story, could you tell right away? What, pretty much. Pretty quickly, right? It didn't take much to know if someone was showing you that care and compassion and at the very least was connecting with you, right? Was there? And I think actually you said it because you didn't call out anyone in particular, of course, or, or make a big deal. But I think you, you commented on people that might have been, been doing their job but were not connecting with you and emotionally showing an empathy or compassion. Because don't we know? We know right away. Okay, so well, the, 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 the exercise. exercise. You yeah, you got them. Yeah. Okay, is it in the? It's oh, in I have. Folder. Okay, I'm so sorry. I thought they were in your okay, folder. So Here, let me grab. Let me grab the folder. So we have a few. I know. Um, uh, I think. I think 
Well, in fact, I know Mark just mentioned something about medications and having medications by the bedside, and um, that actually is one of the role plays we have. But we have a few role plays for you. Yeah. And Sorry. Mark, do you think I thought they were in the program. Yeah, stay in your stay this? in your groups. I don't really know where your groups are, but it what I'm going to do matter. is it doesn't really there's, matter. There's two separate there's, scenarios. There's two scenarios. I am going to so there's a there's a yellow scenario and a blue scenario, and do there's you want me to four. Hear about the sure, sure, maybe just one you can kind of gather when I give one to okay. this group here so in your groups of let's say five or so we want you one maybe one person can read the scenario out loud and then using and then using your leap model you can use leap you can use whatever version feels comfortable to you but maybe each of you will play a role someone can be the patient someone can be the nurse in the scenario and then you can take turns with how are you going to respond to the, the issue we have the leap tool which is phenomenal um, you have the managing expectations tool which the thing is, I don't know if you picked up on it, but you already, in so many cases, you already know the answers. It's more about applying it to each individual patient. And I know that's the hard part. Just because something is simple doesn't mean it's easy. In fact, sometimes the simplest things are the hardest. So you have that also to take back and to really utilize. Um, because remember, as and I, I Janice was just sharing it, the Caritas Compassionate Care Unit. I like that. That's really great. Nice. <laughs> That's the, the expectation that you, na you all have of your unit. So it takes really working towards that on a daily basis, which you do, to really put that front of mind. Another thing you have in your packet in the blue folder as a takeaway is this and if you want to pull it out you don't need to fill it out today but I recommend you fill it out by tomorrow and it could be as sim simple the simpler the better it's called start stop and continue so if everyone can pull that out right now and while you're pulling it out I just want to remind uh, not remind you I want to mm -hmm. point out to you that all the um, the feedback that you shared, all the um, the really great um, sh uh, shares that you placed up on the wall about what what you love most about the dark um, will be provided to you. I'm going to write it all up, and you're going to be getting it all. So it says, "Compassionate care begins with me. Using my special gifts and attributes, I will contribute to Team Caritas by starting whatever that is you're going to start." It could be a simple thing, and it's unique to each one of you, but starting. Stopping, same thing. One thing you're going to try to stop. You're going to attempt to stop doing. And then continuing. If something's working great, don't change it. Just keep doing it. After you complete that, I want you to fold it. And I want you to fold it like this. I want you to write your name clearly on here. And I want you, actually I want you to do it today, if you can, if you can think of it. Because I'm going to collect them. And in a month from now, I'm going to give it to Janice. She's never going to look at this, Janice. You're never going to see this. This is all personal. <laughs> but then you give each one of these to the person whose name is on this. As a reminder of what you committed to yourself today.